stands forever. Did you know that trends and styles come and go, but the word of our God stands forever? Amen. That, uh, that pop psychology is always changing, but the word of our God lasts forever. The best-selling books on the best-selling uh, list this week will not be the same books on it next week because uh, changes are always taking place. But the truth is this, guys. If God said something was true a thousand years ago, you know what that means? It means that 500 years ago, it was still true. And today, it's still true. And a thousand years from today, it will still be true. Now, this is what I've noticed in our society. People have kind of gotten a hold of God's word and they say things like this. You know, I really like this thing where it says here about building your life on a solid foundation. But you know, when it talks about this type of sin over here, I don't really like that type of sin. And so I don't really agree with the Bible. So I'm just going to choose what I think over the Bible. And, and the reality is, guys, you cannot treat God's word that way. You can't pick and choose what you want to believe. Why? Because it's all God's word or it's not all of God's word. There cannot be any in, in between. Well, why is it that, Pastor? Well, let me just ask you a question. If you can pick and choose what was true and what was not, let me just ask you, who gets to make the choice? You? Me? Me? The person that we admire the most? Well, the reality is, guys, it's either all of God's word or it's none of God's word. You know, a lot of people treat God's word like it's this big buffet. How many of you like hometown buffet? Good food, right? They have some good food there. There's some other great buffets out there. But how many of you know when you go to hometown buffet, you grab your plate, you grab your, your fork and your knife, and you skip the salads because who needs that anyway, right? right. You go right to the good stuff, right? <laughs> Well, a lot of people treat God's word like it's a buffet. I like this, but I don't like that. And so I'll just skip that. I don't have to listen to it. Well, the reality is, guys, God's word was meant to last forever. And it can help us to have core convictions. Now, notice this. Why was the Bible given to us? Well, notice this passage on your, on your outline up here on the screen. It says the whole Bible was given to us by inspiration from God and is useful to teach us what is true, make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It straightens us out. It helps us do what is right. It's God's way of making us well prepared at every point. Now, think about this, guys. The reason that we have the Bible is to help us become everything that God wants us to be. I, I love this. It's, it teaches what is true. It makes us realize what's wrong in my life. It straightens me out. It helps me do the right thing. And it says it helps me to become prepared at every area of my life. Now, I don't know about you, but I need that. Because if I had it my own way, I'd go and do my own thing. And yet God says, I'll show you exactly what I want. Well, how do you get God's word into your life? Let me just ask that question now. Look up here for a second, guys. How do you get God's word into your life? Well, there's a few ways. You can read it, right? Hopefully you guys are reading it. Or you can listen to it on, on your cassette on your oh, cassette player. Sorry, that's coming gone. <laughs> your, your MP3 player. Sorry. Um, you can listen to it. You can memorize it. You can meditate on it. Now, meditation doesn't mean you empty your brain and hum some crazy little sound like oh, that doesn't mean meditation. What meditation is is this, guys. Meditation is focusing on God's word. If you've ever worried or stressed about something, you know what it is to focus on something. You take that same energy and you focus it on God's word, and, and that's fixing your attention. Now notice this. Brothers and sisters, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right. Think about the things that are pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Well, I want you to notice this. The conviction that we can have is one that can last forever. Now, put this in practical sense. If you're going to leave a legacy, isn't it good to have something worth leaving in the first place? I've said this to, to, to dads everywhere. I said, dads, uh, you set the standard in your home. You're either going to have a conviction about God or you're not. You're going to set the standard of making church a priority, becoming a part. Uh, 
you know, if you're a single mother, you set that standard for your kids in the home. Now, think about this, guys. What are our convictions going to be built upon? Something that lasts forever or something that changes in season one year, out of season the next. Now notice this. There's a second thing that God will help, uh, help us to have and that we can build our life upon. And that's this. When we build character into our lives. The second tool that we can use to build a godly legacy or a lasting legacy is our character. We'll notice this. What is character? Well, character is this. Who you are when nobody else is around. Does that make sense? It's who you are when nobody else is around. Because the truth is, you can fool everybody you want to fool. You can fool your spouse. You can fool uh, your kids. Your kids can fool you. You can fool your teachers. You can fool whoever you want to fool. But character is who you really are. And I would take it even a step further, and I would say this. Character is who you are or claim to be in your home and then who you try to be out in the world. Sometimes there's a difference. Sometimes when we're at home, we don't always act the way God wants us to act. And when we're in front of people, we put on this smiley face or this Christian look that we're trying to pretend that we have it all together. And yet the Bible says we have to have character all of the time, not just once in a while. Well, notice this. What does God expect of us? Well, Romans 8, 28 tells us. He says, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to this purpose. Now notice this. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Well, look up here for a second. The Bible says that God wants us to become more like Jesus. He wants us to become more of like him in character and who we are. Living a godly life. Now, let me just let me just read this. Michelangelo was a great sculptor, and he he was asked one time, "How did you sculpt the famous David? How did you do that?" Well, his his response is pretty classic. He just says this: "Well, I just chipped away everything that didn't look like David. It's as simple as that." Now think about this. If God wants us to be like Jesus Christ, he's going to have to chip away some parts of us that don't look like Jesus. Does that make sense? And in some areas of our life, he'll take some soft sandpaper and he'll smooth out the rough edges. And in other ways, he'll take a jackhammer and he'll work really hard to knock off the hard points in your life. Well, there's three things that God will use in order us to help us to become more like Christ. And I want you to notice these. On your, on your outline, the P's up there. The, the first one stands for this. Problems. God will allow problems to come into our life in order to help us become more like Christ. And if you're a believer today, you got to listen to this. Every problem has a purpose. Now, every problem might not come from God. They're not directly given from God, but God does allow them and he can use them for a purpose. Now, notice this under outline. It says this. We also rejoice in our sufferings. Isn't that great news? The Apostle Paul says it's great to have sufferings. We're excited to have problems in our life. Well, notice this. Why? He says, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. If you've ever had a problem, you've ever worked through something, you ever overcame something, you ever battled an addiction or something like that. God was working perseverance in your life. And he says this, we rejoice because now we have perseverance and perseverance builds what character and it builds character. It becomes who we really are. God can take the worst thing that we've ever done, turn it around and build character out of our lives. Now, notice this character produces hope. Character produces hope. Well, why is that? Because when we have problems, we can have hope that God will help us through those problems. Now, think about this, guys. If God is going to build character in your life, he's going to allow problems to come. And we shouldn't be upset about that. We should look, God, what is it you're trying to show me through this? Help me to build my character. 
Lord, I hope my hope is in you. Number two, on your ally, there's a second thing that God uses, and that's pressures. He uses pressures to build, develop character in our life. You might call them stresses. The most Christ-like people I've ever seen, the most people, the people that I've seen living the closest to God, that no matter what happens, they are calm during the fire or the flame. I don't know if you've ever seen somebody like that. When a big, huge problem comes their way, they're calm. And, and they're confident that God is there and he's with them and he's helping them. I want you to notice this. He says, the Bible says this. He says, for God sometimes uses sorrow in our lives. Did you know that? 